Welcome to everyone who's joined us this evening. Um, tonight we're going to, we have our, our guest is Aaron Likens, and um, he is coming to us. Where did you say you are today, Aaron? I'm uh, outside St. Petersburg, Florida. Okay, so he's been traveling all around the country the last couple of days, so he's joining us tonight from afar. Um, and I just want to introduce everyone, if, if this is your first event, these are our conversations on diversity through Jefferson College. And we've been hosting a series of events um, based on uh, all many issues of diversity. So uh, April is actually Autism Aware Awareness Month. So we've had, this is actually our second event now, um, talking about autism. And so um, I knew Aaron from a while back. I attended a, a clinic or a lecture that he gave um, about maybe 10 years ago. So, um, and Christine Platter, who is our um, head of DSS services at Jefferson College, also had recommended Aaron. So uh, we decided to bring him on. He's, um, Aaron has a, I'll post in the chat also so everyone knows. I'll post his webpage. He has a book called Finding Kansas. I'm sure he'll tell you about it. And then I've also got the Q&A open. But the plan is, is that Aaron is going to basically just talk to us for about 30, 40 minutes. And then we're going to go into breakout rooms. And I have some questions just for group discussion. And then we'll all come back together again, and then we can use the Q&A if you want to turn your microphone on and talk, or if you want to enter questions into the Q&A, you can do that. So if you don't um, know where that is, if you've never used Google Meet, off to the right side, if you have the white box, the white box over on the right side has a triangle square circle. If you click on that, it shows you the Q&A. So you can open that up to enter questions if you like. And if we don't answer the questions right, Right off the bat, we probably won't. We're going to let Aaron talk for a while. We'll, we'll get to those questions later on. So, but you're welcome to uh, enter questions at any time. So, welcome, please, Aaron Likens. Oh, uh, thank you. Yes, my name is Aaron Likens. As mentioned, author of the book Finding Kansas, which is about my life with Asperger's. I was able to write it from a firsthand account, but my diagnosis in life came later, age 20. But just because I got diagnosed later in life, all the signs were there ahead of time, but nobody knew what to make of me. And at every parent-teacher conference, my parents heard the same thing. They heard, well, your son, Aaron, he, he doesn't socialize or associate too well with the other kids, but you know, uh, don't worry about it. Uh, maybe he's smarter. So my parents had selective hearing. They only heard the second half of that sentence that, they, that I might be smarter. So... They took that as a sign that they were the best parents in the world. But what did my teachers mean by I didn't associate or socialize? Well, started in kindergarten. And I have to say, I loved kindergarten. Kindergarten was amazing because we got to play with these very fun thin-sided blocks. There's a six-sided yellow honeycomb thing, orange square, green triangle, blue diamond. And putting those together, <laughs> I don't want to say my life peaked in kindergarten, but I have not found anything as fun as those blocks. Those blocks were... <laughs> Good times. But anyway, my classmates, they tried to join in the fun. And here is the problem. They, they, they um, well, they didn't know what they were doing. They were doing it wrong. Maybe they used a little bit too much yellow over here. Maybe a little bit too much orange over there. But they were doing it wrong. So I would go over and tell them. Actually, no, I'd go over and destroy what they were doing. And I'd say, no, you're doing it wrong. It's destroy it. Because in my mind, there's the right way. And in everybody else's mind is the wrong way. But I may, I may still think that from time to time. But back then, I had no idea that that was not the most appropriate way of trying to interact with my classmates. But eventually, after a couple of weeks, nobody else joined in the fun. And I was OK with that. In kindergarten, though, I did make the attempt to socialize with my classmates. I didn't go about it in the most traditional of ways, but I tried. I grew up in Indianapolis where just like Missouri, um, or just like most anywhere in the Midwest in the springtime, severe weather, a constant threat. And here's the thing about weather. One, I did find it really interesting. Two, I was absolutely deathly afraid of it. And I was sure every single day a tornado was going to come and wipe Indianapolis clean off the map. I was sure of it. So because I was afraid of it, I knew a lot about it. So picture this, I'm in kindergarten having a conversation or attempting to with my classmate, oh, you know, about very simple topics, such as the National Weather Service and a threat of a tornado watch because of the jet stream that's intermingling with a low pressure system that's going to be influenced by a jet stream that's going to bring up some of the Gulf moisture. 
<laughs> um, yeah, my classmates naturally would just slowly back away from me. And I might as well have been speaking, I don't know, Martian. I, I think had I been speaking a language from another planet, my classmates would have understood me a whole lot more than all this weather technical jargon I was saying. But here is the problem. Being on the autism spectrum, a lot of us, we are not good at picking up on nonverbal social cues, facial expressions. So as my classmates slowly backed away from me, well, myself, I just kept walking with them and getting closer and closer and closer and giving them more weather information than they could ever possibly use and love everything every single minute of it. Took most of the school year, uh, but eventually I learned nobody my own age was listening to a word I had to say. So I gravitated towards talking to adults, either because they knew what I was talking about or they were very good at pretending on knowing what I was talking about. But in first grade, I love recess. Most first graders do love recess, run around, be loud, be obnoxious myself. Oh no, that wasn't recess, not at all. Recess for me was known as a 30-minute monologue with the teacher. It was awesome because in the morning, I would draw a weather map. So uh, first thing at recess would be I would deliver the weather forecast. And on Mondays, oh, Mondays were awesome because they were home of the five-day forecast. So I really brought it home on a Monday. And while well, growing up in Indi Indianapolis, auto racing is a sport of choice. So on Mondays and Tuesdays, I give a race recap of the previous weekend's races. Thursdays and Fridays would be race previews. And I got to say, I love those recesses. However, my second grade teacher, um, when I was in second grade, she um, she uh, she had enough of it at, with about a month in the school year. So about this time of year, and I think, I, I really think she was trying to motivate me to talk to people my own age. But what, well, at one recess, she had had enough, and she looked at me, and she said, Aaron, 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 if you don't go play with the other kids right now, you're never going to recess again. Probably not the best thing to tell a um, second grader, but knowing what I know now, I can't believe it took her that long to finally issue that threat because I not, I taught nonstop 30 minutes every single day and uh, memories. Well, another problem in second grade that I had was I learned the patterns of the school's fire drills. That might not sound like a big deal, but a high percentage of us on the autism spectrum, eh, roughly 80%, 80% of us will have a sensory issue in one form or another. Now, for some individuals, it might be a certain type of clothing. Other individuals, a certain type of lights may just be too harsh. But for me, my sensory issues are to sound. And when I say sensory issues to sound, it is, unless you've experienced a sensory issue with sound, it's very hard to describe it. But I have three that might get you somewhat in the same zip code um, to des describe what a sensory issue feels like. Oddly enough, for a fire alarm, it sort of makes me feel like I have fire flowing through my veins. Example two, let's say you're in a car and there's a close call. Somebody pulls out in front of you or you pull out in front of someone not seeing it. There's screeching brakes, near miss. Your heart rate's going to go through the roof. You're going to get that surge of adrenaline. Or example three, you're driving down an empty interstate. You come over a crest of a hill, and there's a highway patrolman in the median with the radar pointed in your general vicinity. Even if you're doing the speed limit, your heart rate's going to pick up as you make sure you're not speeding. You're going to get that momentary burst of adrenaline. And in examples two and three, take that moment of your peak heart rate, your peak adrenaline, amplify it, and sustain it. That's the best way I can attempt to describe what a sensory issue feels like. Not pleasant. Going back to when I was in second grade, though, here is the problem. Since I was experiencing this, I thought everyone else was too. I thought since I experienced this extreme discomfort, this pain, everyone else did too. Yet every fire drill, I look around the room, Nobody else was fidgeting. Nobody else looked like they were in any discomfort whatsoever. So I can only draw one of two conclusions. Either everybody else is really strong or I was really weak. And in second grade or any grade for that matter, nobody wants to be labeled the weak one, the wimp. So, well, further compounding this problem, as I said, was I learned the patterns. If we were going to have a fire drill, it was always on a Thursday. So I quickly learned not to be in school on a Thursday. Now it is known that we on the autism spectrum, we may resort to a behavior to get out of an activity or task. And 
my behavior, I didn't misbehave, but my behavior, I became a very good actor every Thursday morning. If I would have been in a production or a movie, I surely would have been nominated for best actor in the categories of best headache, throat ache, stomach ache that didn't exist. Oh, I would put on some award winning performances, but eventually my dad did learn when I was and wasn't sick. So I had to upgrade my tactics. Thermometer, coffee, works great to have a fever in the morning. And tell your press you're lucky and you show your dad a fever of 107.7. And at that point in time, you lose all credibility. The trick never works again. And even when you are sick, nobody believes you. So when I present to student bodies, I'm very, very forthcoming because I tell the story and I think, oh, if the teachers may think I'm giving kids a way out of school. But no, I let them know you do that. You get caught once. Nobody's ever going to believe you again. So that backfired on me. Well, Third, fourth, fifth, sixth grade came around. More problems popped up. The ever-changing social dynamics confused me to no end. But secondly, sensory issues. Um, so often, I'm, I'm already guilty of this as a speaker talking about uh, fire drills. But in, in the sense that when we talk about sensory issues, so often it's something to the superlative, something to the extreme. You don't need extreme to have sensory issues. Myself, I'm hypersensitive to my surroundings. So in the classroom setting, 20, 25, 30 students, I heard every noise. Um, right now, if you were in here about two minutes before I started, you might have seen me get up. I'm at a hotel right now in St. Petersburg, and there was an air conditioning right beside me that if I would have been trying to present with that going on, I'd still be trying to introduce myself and say my name, and it just... It might, by this point in time, it would just be awkward for everyone. So be thankful I went over and turned the air conditioner off so it wouldn't distract me. I'm sure it's going to come on at some point in time and then you'll get to see it. But think of that in a classroom setting. I just said, you know, I'm a public speaker. I should be able to play through things. I said, if that air conditioner two feet away from me was going, I'd be unable to give this presentation. So too in a classroom. If there were kids, you know, just tap, tap, tapping, I might not be able to concentrate on what the teacher was saying. If the walls were thin, which my second school, they were, I could hear what was going on in that classroom, that classroom, that classroom, and what was going on out in the hall. Sometimes this was a big advantage because I would hear tomorrow's lesson today, so I was a day ahead. But, oh, if the other two rooms, if I was hearing yesterday's, that was just more input that I could no longer focus on what I had to focus on. That being so, I, I mentioned it. It's very hard. And um, when I have about 30, 40 minutes to present, I like covering my five most important statements about autism. And this is the best time to introduce number five. And that is living life on the autism spectrum is like living life unfiltered. I think if you want two words to describe autism, if somebody just gave you two, which it's going to take a lot more than two words to describe it. But if you just want two words to describe it, I think life unfiltered. You might be able to come up with something better, but right now, in my opinion, life unfiltered is the best two words to describe it. So since this life unfiltered thing is playing out, I'm attempting. I have to try to filter out all that background noise, but, and I've heard this from so many other teachers and parents, that my story is other kids' stories that come about 11 o'clock, come about noon, after three or four hours of trying to filter out what I can't. I was completely exhausted, completely drained. No more, I, I couldn't have any more attention left. Uh, homework at night wouldn't get done. I was so exhausted. I was in bed by six a lot of times just because I was just so drained from trying to filter out what I couldn't. With that being said, I, I mentioned on fire drill days, I had real, or I faked my headaches, but it was to the point I was having horrible stomach issues, horrible neck issues, constant headaches. So we had to go to homeschooling halfway through sixth grade. And halfway through seventh grade, I decided I wanted to go back because, well, school couldn't be as hard as I remembered. So I went back and, well, <laughs> same behaviors popped up after three days. So that didn't work out. And I finished up my schooling career. Flash forward five years after that, it was... Uh, it was 2003, November, December, and I got my Asperger diagnosis. So age 20, got my diagnosis. I didn't know what it meant. Um, the first time somebody mentioned I might be on the on, um, I might be autistic, I said, wait, 
I don't have an artistic bone in my body. I actually got an F in first grade art. So, and I've been, uh, I told that to an elementary school teacher once and she cried that no first grader would ever deserve an F in art. Oh, though, she did not see my art. Oh, I deserve that. So I didn't know what it was whatsoever. And neither did my doctor. My doctor sent me to go get an assessment because my dad um, read a thing in Parade Magazine that was my life story word for word. And finally, there was an answer for all the behaviors. Doctor complied and sent me to go get an assessment, but he didn't know what that meant. So he was reading the assessment in front of me on my diagnosis day going, "Uh uh-huh. Uh huh. Reading this here. Yep. Oh. Mm hmm. Well, there's no doubt about it. You have Asperger's. Uh, I don't know what that means. Uh, good luck. Hmm. Good luck. Okay. If you're like me and you're given a medical term that you don't know, there's only one place to turn to, and that's the internet because everything on the internet's true. All <laughs> right. Uh, very first website I came across in December 2003 made a bold proclamation and my life mission ever since I, after I finished my book, so maybe about 09, uh, this story happened in 03, but I now know this website was completely false. But what it said was that people with Asperger's will never have a job, will never have friends, will never be happy. Horrible introduction, the worst introduction possible. And unfortunately for me, I believe those words. And in life, autism spectrum or not, in life, if you believe in those, the don'ts, the can'ts, that's exactly what's going to happen to you. And that's what happened to me. I pushed everybody in my life away. I didn't care about any person, any place, anything. And if I could have disappeared, if I could have vanished, I probably would have been okay with it. Then 15 months later, at the brink of inner self-destruction, I sat down on my computer and I started to write. And that's bizarre because I hated writing in school, hated it. But I started writing and for the first time in my life, I was expressing myself on the emotional level. I was the least emotional person in the world. If you ask me anything subjective, anything remotely close to the realm of emotions, I said three and only three words. I don't know. But I started writing and eventually got the book of Finding Kansas, and I never intended on being an author, and I most certainly never intended on being a public speaker. This is my 1,000, near my 1,040th presentation now. I I can't believe this because I'm one of the shyest people you will meet. I know you're not believing me right now. Trust me, if you see me outside, no, this is new for me. This is only my fifth or sixth presentation like this, which if you've just seen the first four or five, I've I've made big strides because I, it's really hard talking to a little white dot on the computer, but we all, it's a different world now. And this is, I'm actually, I could actually find this easy actually, but uh, tangents aside, I never intended on being a public speaker, being shy. If you would have told me 11 years ago, this is what I would be doing. I would have laughed at you. And I would have said that, why would you say that? That is downright cruel because I'm never going to be able to do that. Yeah, here I am. I never intended on any of this when I wrote my book. I was just maybe crying out. I I just wanted my family to know who I was and why I was. And since then, this is what I've been doing. I've wanted to disprove that website. And as I mentioned, I do have the five most important statements about autism that I sort of came up with. I coined all the terms except number one, but going back to life unfiltered. That can definitely go with sensory issues, but secondly, it can also go to emotions. It, I heard just, I heard on a news story just a couple months ago, the, the misnomer that every time I hear it, I just wanna throw something at the television, but televisions are expensive, so don't throw things at televisions. But it was, well, you know, people on the autism spectrum, they just don't have emotions. Okay, we have all the emotions in the world. Never let anybody tell you that we lack emotions. For myself, I try to just not, I try not to acknowledge them. They're there, but it's life's a lot easier if you don't experience emotions, which means when you bottle emotions up, eventually they're gonna get to a level 11 out of 10. And at that point in time, the emotion is gonna be felt at an unfiltered level. Going back to when I was in school, when I would talk about auto racing or weather, I was experiencing that. I was talking at that at an unfiltered level. I was so joyous, so just over the moon of excitement that no one else shared, but that was my favorite thing in the world. So 
I, I understand why they didn't share it. And one of the reasons why they couldn't understand or, and why I didn't understand they didn't understand was I was talking about things that were in my Kansas. Kansas is the title chapter of my book. And uh, I've heard a lot of doctors, um, clinicians, as I was writing my book, I heard them say, well, people in the autism spectrum may have an area of defined interest or knowledge that they're going to want to talk about to the exclusion of everything else. Okay, that works. That's really long, and I barely understood it back when the first time I heard it. Well, as I was writing my book, I wanted to describe to my dad why certain subjects I fly in. So when um, I, I wrote a chapter, and well... The concept is this. Imagine that the only time, well, in every state except Kansas, in every state except Kansas, you, you just are socially paralyzed. You can't talk. Processing takes 25,000 times longer. You're always, you just don't feel comfortable in your own skin. Just nothing is working properly. Yet, when you go into the borders of Kansas, like magic, you feel normal. Uh, I, I'm, I'm uncomfortable with normal because I don't think normal exists. I do think there's one normal person out there. And if we do find that person, well, find them because congratulations, you have found the most boring individual in the galaxy. So that is my definition of normal. But I think the term wanting to become more normal is appropriate because I've lived like that most of my life want, wanting that normal. But when I'm talking about my favorite thing, that, that's what happens. I, I, I will, one, talk, talk at an unfiltered level sometimes and talk too fast. And you can give me social signs that you don't care, but yeah, good luck with that. You're going to get more information on uh, my Kansas than you probably care to learn. But that's where I'm excited. That's where I feel normal. Uh, so when we talk about that, you may get that emotion to an unfiltered level, that joy, that pure joy, that for my teachers, it had to be really confusing why I could talk about the history of auto racing back 100 years, and yet when it came to things other people just know, I was oblivious. Well, going to the number four, uh, the fourth most important statement it is whatever happens first always has to happen. Routine, routine, routine. We on the autism spectrum typically do like routine, and whatever happens first always has to happen as a way to sort of describe that. So in my book, I describe it like this. Imagine the mind on the autism spectrum having a camera that uses film. And anytime there is a new event, a new situation, a new person, a new anything, imagine the mind taking a snapshot, printing the film, and putting it in a portfolio. Now, anytime that situation or what have you is duplicated, we on the autism spectrum, we already know what's going to happen because, well, whatever happens first always has to happen. This was tricky in school, especially when there were, was a substitute. I was a terror when we had substitutes, and I think they all eventually knew who I was. Um, but in, in second grade, we had a sub, and every other kid in the class loved this concept. She came in, and she put a wheel on the board. It, it was a nice, big-sized wheel, and it was segmented into different subjects. And she would spin the wheel, and whatever subject came up next would be the next subject we would do. So if social studies was typically first, it may end up last because it was all by the luck of the wheel. No, no, no. We had a schedule. We had a routine. And the first time that wheel came out, oh, my hand came up, and I said, um, that's not the way Mrs. Ginger does it. And this sub, she was very polite about it. She said, oh, yes, Aaron, I know. Spun the wheel. Second hour, carbon copy. Third hour, carbon copy. Well, even lunch and recess were in jeopardy of being at different times. And the fourth hour, oh, I finally had a logical debate. Yeah, all I was saying was that, that that's not the way Mrs. Ginger does it. But I finally had a logical debate. The wheel was right here. Our daily printed visual schedule was right beside it. So I, I said, no, 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 we, we have a schedule. She went, oh? Oh, yeah. So she leisurely walked over, ripped it off the wall, threw it on the floor, and spun the wheel. And after that, she didn't talk to me for the rest of the week. We had her for the entire week. When The following Monday, when my second grade teacher came back, she, for some reason, thought she needed to go on vacation in Florida, which that week, 
Indianapolis was warmer than Florida. So, oh, you know, I let her know that the weather was better in Indianapolis. And so she, there was no reason why she needed to go to Florida. Coming in at number three, I think, therefore, you should know. This is uh, the, the more clinical term is theory of mind, which I take statements at literal value. Theory of mind. What does that mean? Is the mind a theory? I, I don't know what that's trying to say whatsoever. So because I coined the term, I'm kind of biased, but I think therefore you should know, in my opinion, explains it a whole lot clearer. What, what this, um, the way this can play out though, is that our intentions sometimes aren't going to be understood. So I had a girlfriend for many years in the early 2000s. We bowled on the same bowling team. And one Monday evening, she came in with an outfit that was different. I can describe it one of two different ways. She was either trying to look like a tent contraption structure thingy, or she just got done with the Star Wars edition as some weird alien from, from some weird planet nobody's ever heard of. It was that obscure. I have been all around the world. I have not seen anything remotely close to it since. Thank goodness. Anyway, though, that evening, other people looked at her. But when I saw her, I asked the first thing that came to my mind. Um, <laughs> what is that? No, there was no anger in my words. There was no malice. It was a really simple question. I just wanted to know what planet her clothes came from. That's all. Well, she didn't take too kindly to that, and I had no idea. I had no idea she was upset. I had no idea she was angry, and I had no idea she was giving me the look. The look that the next two words out of my mouth best be, I'm sorry. I had no idea. Well, 10-minute practice period before a league came and went. It became her turn to bowl. And I, being the rule stickler, which, uh, quick side note, we in the autism spectrum, we may be the rules enforcer. And, I mean, we're not trying to undermine anyone's authority or trying to get people in trouble. It's just that rules are meant to be followed. <laughs> Yesterday, I I, uh, I, I've had a, just a super busy three days Uh well, two, uh, Sunday, I was working the IndyCar race in Alabama, and then yesterday morning, I had to fly to St. Louis, and then my dad picked me up at the airport, and I rode to Burlington, Iowa to present to the police there, and at the police station, at, at, during my presentation, when I mentioned that we in the autism spectrum, we may let everyone know that they're doing it wrong, such as my dad on the drive up here. There were several times that you know that double yellow line just got driven, and speed limit sometimes seemed to maybe be a significant suggestion which my dad was there and I was saying that and I had no idea what type of response I was going to get but he just grumbled it's true so yes um I will be the first one to let you know that you're doing it wrong no malice it's just rules need to be followed which means going back to this bowling story it became her turn to bowl her she didn't have her bowling shoes on yet it be, it was her turn to bowl so I turned to her politely and very politely, very respectfully, and somewhat enthusiastically, I said, you're up. And that made her more mad because she was expecting, I'm sorry, not exactly talking about bowling. And she didn't talk to me for several weeks thereafter. The thing with, I think, therefore, you should know, I, I can know something or I, I did this a lot. And I will still do this at presentations sometimes. I have to watch myself. But if I'm telling you a story... I may not give you the relevance. I may not give you act one or two of a four act story. I'll start middle of act three, but why do I need to give you the background? Because since I know it, you already know it. So it can be extremely difficult for us to put ourselves where you are and understand you really might not understand what I am talking about. Coming in at number two is logical and emotional world. We on the spectrum may take uh, literal things um, or things that aren't meant to be literal and take them literal because we're just looking at it from a logical standpoint. That girlfriend I had, um, six months later, got my Asperger diagnosis. She read bad information on the internet as well. So she started backing away from me slowly. So I had to figure out if she still liked me. Most people could probably call, meet up and say, hey, are we okay? Everything fine? myself. No, I couldn't do that. That involved talking about emotions. So what I had to do, I had to get creative, had to get crafty, 
and I came up with a great idea. In my mind, this was a win-win-win-win situation. Nothing bad could come from this. So to see if she still liked me, I decided I had to break up with her. And I did so on Christmas. And I did so via text message. Yeah, and that was back on the phones where you had to press a button three or four times to get the actual, that was some dedicated text messaging going on there. But in my mind, though, I was just looking at it from a logical standpoint. She would simply text me back and say, everything's fine, and that'd be the end of that. Well, I stayed up till 6 a.m. The phone never rang. In result, I've only talked to her twice since Christmas 2003. So did a number on that relationship having no intentions of doing so. For another person, that the way this can play into their life, this happened to a, a teenager in the St. Louis area back in October 2013. And this kid, valedictorian of his high school, and never been in any problems, any trouble with anyone, until one day he did get pulled over by a police officer. Now, he, he had the Missouri Driving Handbook memorized, but utilizing that in a social situation really didn't work because he knew lies and sirens behind him at pull over. Unfortunately, that's the only thing he understood. So when the officer came and tapped on the window, he looked at the officer and looked forward. Well, that made the officer not too happy. So the officer pounds a glass a little bit harder. The person on the spectrum looks at the officer and goes, <laughs> what? And looks forward. Now, third time, officer pounds a glass and says, sir, roll on your window now. The person did so, and he very calmly asked the officer, oh, why didn't you say so in the first place? Story goes downhill from there. The officer then asked the unfortunate worded question of, sir, can I see your license? Person on the spectrum thought about it for a moment and said, no. The, the officer now, he's had enough. Uh, in the most stern matter of fact voice, he says, sir, can I see your license now? Well, the person on the spectrum knew something was going on, but he didn't know what. So he, he's thinking harder, and that's one thing for us on the spectrum. We start Things slow down, we may come up with the rant. So he's thinking harder, trying to figure out what type of riddle, what type of trick question this is. And the only answer he can come up with to tell the officer is, no, you still can't see my license. Well, he was immediately arrested for disobeying the orders of an officer and obstruction of a peace officer's duty, taken to the station. Thank goodness the officers there had been given autism training. They were able to read between the lines. They realized he wasn't trying to intentionally be obstinate, defiant, non-compliant, or any of those other really long words. So, so no charges were filed, but per protocol, his mom had to come to pick him up at the station. She's in tears. Again, he's never been in any one bit of trouble, much less needed to be picked up at the police station. So she's in tears. She gets her son, and she said, son, why didn't you help the officer? Well, the... 18-year-old was just as confused then as he was at the beginning of this whole ordeal. And he said, but mom, I was trying to help the officer. He kept asking if he could see my license. <laughs> How could he? It was in my wallet. For those on the autism spectrum, when you are logical and emotional world, it can be very confusing. We're, we may see things at absolute literal value, absolute logical value. And that means the emotional ramifications of what we say may not be understood. That 18 year old had no idea that the officer would take that as a complete sign of disrespect. For the person on the spectrum, he didn't see that. We can be so logical, we are blind to the emotional ramifications of, if life were a chess match, we're blind to the emotional ramifications of our proverbial chess moves. Coming in at number one, though, um, this is the most important statement. I did not coin this term, I did the other four, but if you've met one person with autism, you've only met one person with autism. Kansas, the concept of Kansas is such a great example of that. My Kansas is auto racing and through 26 years of working in the sport as a flagman uh, last season, I got to experience what it was like uh, being a flagman for the NTT IndyCar series. Never would imagine I would make it to my dream job, and yet I did. But other people on the spectrum, a racetrack might not be their a desirable place. It's loud. It's noisy. There's a lot of sensory elements in play. For me, that's where I feel great. But the the very tricky thing to describe 
the autism spectrum to those that don't know it is that myself, well, I, I have sensory issues to fire alarms, but also to drums, drums, just the drums. I mean, we don't get along. So here I am working at a racetrack with sensory issues. Yeah, I can handle that environment, but drums will be very bad. That That's so difficult to explain to, you know, teachers that may have never had a student on the spectrum or have ever had any uh, training or heard any speakers because so often society wants everything to fit into a nice, tidy box. The autism spectrum isn't that. Because I know uh, south of St. Louis, you can go to Perryville. Uh, there's a mother there. She has three daughters and each daughter has Asperger's and they're all semi-professional drummers. So how do you explain to someone that here I am, drums, bad, bad news, yet same diagnosis for them, it's their Kansas. So one person's Kansas could be the next person's complete opposite of Kansas. So in terms of autism awareness, which I think we do have autism awareness, people know that autism exists. We're now to that understanding phase that it is a full spectrum, that you can have two people, same diagnosis, and you know we're not all going to be a Sheldon Cooper. We're not all going to be a Rain Man. The spectrum is vast. It's broad. There's people that can make eye contact, people that will prefer not to, people that are going to be great at socializing and understand sarcasm, and others that, well, sarcasm or non-literal statements may end up with a police story like the Wallace story. So those are my five uh, most important statements. I will turn it back over for the uh, remaining format. Thanks, Aaron. So um, we're gonna jump into little breakout rooms and I have some questions. I don't know, I think everybody's probably coming from different places with their, maybe their knowledge of autism, their experience of autism, experience with autism, experience with people with autism. Um, so you may or may not know sort of many of those things Aaron was talking about with the criteria of, uh, or typical personality traits or some, some things some people have in common. So I'm gonna post some questions. I'm gonna put everybody in breakout rooms and um, uh, I, I'm going to split us into three rooms. So uh, I'm going to put, um, well, maybe I'll just do two rooms. I'll put everybody into two rooms and then um, post the questions into the chat of each of those rooms. And so we'll do about 10, 15 minutes uh, and then we'll come back to the main room and then everybody will have a chance to ask Aaron some questions or post stuff into the Q&A. Uh, I think everybody's coming back to the main room here. Get Aaron back in the game. There he is. Um, so I thought maybe um, some of our, our breakout room leaders could share some of the ideas that were shared from one of the room. I was in room two the whole time, so I didn't hear anything that was said in room one. But if uh, Christine or Richard or one of you wants to share some things that happened in your room, and Joel, you can talk about some of the things you talked about. And then um, uh, if you all have questions for Aaron, you can submit those into the Q&A. Maybe we'll just start that way. Everybody have access to the Q&A over on the right side. And then um, Aaron, I did mention to Jamie from Easter Seals, I asked her if she could maybe go over the criteria for autism diagnoses kind of what you were talking about in your list, but more specifically what those criteria are. So I think I'm gonna have her discuss that. So can we just get some feedback from the breakout rooms right now, Richard or Christine, you wanna start? I'll defer to Christine. Go ahead, Christine. Sure, so um, in our breakout room, you know, we kind of addressed the questions, but you know, the topics brought us back um, essentially to, you know, talking about, you know, looking back, did we come across somebody that we thought may fit in that autism spectrum um, diagnoses, you know, somebody we came across in the past and us as educators could, you know, really think of a few things um, where that could be the case. Um, we also talked a little bit about what we wanted to, what, what we wanted our takeaways to be. And I thought that was really interesting. Um, and one of the points was, you know, we wanted neurotypical individuals um, to really be open to other individuals with disabilities, such as autism, not to point fingers or point them as, you know, odd or different. Um, you know, we also discussed wanting to learn 
learn more about how to be more supportive as well as how to um, be better teachers and educators. And so we thought that that was, you know, really neat. Um, and then, you know, we also just kind of talked about um, what some of those um, behaviors or things that we assumed, you know, went with autism, but how, you know, Aaron had said that if you met one person with autism, you've met one person with autism. And so we really took that to heart. Joel, you want to talk about some of the things in the other room? Sure. Um, we, we uh, let's see, we talked about some of, um, well, some of us, my, myself especially, uh, could relate to relationships that we've had with people um, where there were similar stories to, to the types of things that Aaron was sharing, like with the police officer and um, things like that. Um, we talked about sometimes uh, struggling, wanting to make accommodations um, for whether it be for students or coworkers. And, um, you know, certain cases are, are easier to make accommodations for than others. And so kind of that struggle um, uh, or challenge, I should say. And then, um, and then, yeah, I've kind of, kind of just um, wondering a little bit more about that process of, of the diagnosis and what all uh, that entails. And, and uh, you know, someone had brought up uh, how they have a, a relative that, that will see people that, that they have a lot of um, people with special needs in their life. And so they're, they're kind of looking around at even, even strangers or, or other people's kids and kind of diagnosing them on the fly, so to speak. And, um, and so I guess that, that kind of prompted the, the, the questions about, about the actual process um, when someone is diagnosed with autism, um, what that might look like. Uh, do you guys want to go ahead and talk about that? Jennifer? I'm Jennifer, I'm Jennifer from Easter Seals um, Midwest. Um, and um, so the, the, the process of getting a diagnosis for autism, basically there's three main categories um, that, that are looked at. Um, the first is there's, there's always a difficulty with social skills, with social you know, interactions. Um, there's always some kind of difficulty with communication, and there's always some need um, for repetitive repetitive patterns of behavior. So, um, <clears throat> you know, obviously this is where the spectrum comes in because those are really broad categories. So, so, Jennifer, your signal is kind of jumping in and out. I don't know if everybody else is getting that. Yeah, we're kind of um, you're, you're jumbled. Um, I don't know if Ashley's still in. There, I can hear you. You're now. Now. I can hear you now. You're unjumbled. <laughs> oh. Okay. All right. All right. Sorry. I don't know where you, where did I leave off for you guys? You were talking about the repetitive behaviors and the, how those can vary. Okay. Okay. So, yeah. So, um, so, so those are three really broad categories, right? So um, when you talk about communication, you have someone who can be completely nonverbal, someone who has limited verbal skills, someone who can present like Aaron can, um, but still might have difficulty communicating at times. Um, you know, Aaron said he's very different when, you know, he's very shy in person, um, you know, he's got this presenter mode, but it's true, you know, he, his communication kind of breaks down sometimes when you ask him how he is, <laughs> how are you is a really difficult question. So, um, <laughs> he doesn't like it. <laughs> um, so, you know, as far as social skills, it can be just about anything. It could be understanding how to wait in line. Why do I have to take turns? Um, you know not understanding, like Aaron said, the theory of mind or being able to, um, you know, understand what might affect somebody differently than it would affect me. Um, and then with repetitive patterns of behavior, that, that includes sensory, um, your sensory system and the way it works. It also could be um, 
playing with the same toys over and over or always needing to, um, not liking change. That difficulty with change falls under that category. So just, you know, always wanting things to be the same or, or um, you know, having um, the same conversation with people or those and things. So it can look really different in any given person. Um, so in terms of getting the diagnosis, um, there is something called the ADOS. It's the Autism Diagnostic Observation Schedule. Um, and that's really the only standardized test that is used for that. So um, it, it's very, child is very play-based for um, older kiddos or adults who are verbal. Um, it's a lot of questions about feelings and friendships and relationships and those kinds of things. Um, as well as looking at developmental history, what kinds of things did we see when we were really little? Um, you know, so, so it is a process. Um, you know, it's a lot of interviewing parents and interviewing teachers and, and working with the person themselves to get that diagnosis. I, I, I wanted to helped. follow up, Jennifer. Yeah, no, that's great. Thank you. But what you were talking about and Aaron too, with, with being able to just the social aspect, the communicate, social communication, really. I remember my daughter, when she was, we, they went to a small charter school and the principal would stand outside the front door as all the kids came into the building every morning. Good morning, good morning, good morning. And you know, she would just try to get the kids to respond. And every single time, Lizetta, she was so annoyed by this principal saying good morning to everybody because she's like, it's not a good morning. Like whatever her opinion was, she just didn't care. Like, why do you, why are you trying to tell me that it's a good morning? I don't think it's a good morning. So don't tell me that it is. And so she was just constantly annoyed by this principal and the principal would try to get her to look at her or shake her hand on the way in. And Lisetta would always give her this expression like, I don't want to touch you. Don't tell me it's a good morning. Just let me go into the building and get into class. So there, there are definite traits there with, with just, you know, it doesn't work for everybody. What we consider, you know, to be typical social behavior just doesn't work for everybody. And I, I remember hearing once Temple Grandin was speaking about when she was young and her mother had to teach her how to say hello and shake people's hands. And those were just like, maybe we all, you know, everybody else may pick up on that, but like, the, it's not always comfortable for everyone either. Like you can learn what the social norms are, but it doesn't mean that you're comfortable with it. Aaron, you could probably speak to that more too of what some things you've had to deal with. Well, the, the whole don't tell me what to think. Oh, this, this story. So it was 2010 and my dad told me to go to the store and get some golden delicious apples. Oh, I was angry. How dare he tell me that they are delicious apples. I, I, I didn't know that was the name of the type of apple, but oh, I drove to the store. I think I'm, I, I might've gone a little fast, heavy on the accelerator because how, how dare he tell me apples are delicious with that adjective. I was, and then when I went to Schnucks and saw the Apple name, I, uh, yeah. But th th those type of, oh, don't tell me what to think. Did your, did your parents, did, did your dad go through a whole like social lessons with you? Did he have to say, you know, no. Or did he uh, force you to shake people's hands and force you to look people in the eye and say hello and like, I don't know. No, I I was, I, I hate to say this, manipulative enough to just get by without having to do that stuff. I was, I was a good chameleon in a way that I was able to just do just barely enough to where there was no conversations because conversations can be worse than the thing I'm trying to avoid. So I, I had to really weigh a balance on avoid what I don't like, but also avoid conversations because conversations are difficult as well. Did you have issues with like, we were talking about sensory issues, like what were, you said drums, right? There were certain sounds that bothered you. I know my daughter's like in the city here, we get a lot of people who play their stereos super loud, especially the bass of their stereos. She's in severe pain, just sitting even even like five cars away, hearing these stereos. It's severely painful for her. But I know that she, she has other light issues, like, and that's something teachers have to be aware of, like in the classroom, when you think about where the desks are, where the tables are, where the child is sitting. She hates the fluorescent lights, of course. She was always desperate to sit by the window. I need to sit by the window. I need that natural light. 
And in her one classroom, the teacher just kept insisting that the curtains were always closed because the sun was shining and it was too bright. And she's like, what's wrong with you? Like, that's, that's what we need. I need you to open these curtains. I need that light coming in. And so it just understanding that that different children need different things, you know? Someone asked a question, Eric. Oh, go ahead, Aaron. Oh, um, it's just, uh, uh, yesterday in Iowa to those about 35 police officers, I cover sensory issues a lot and I cover fluorescent lights. And when I say some people can hear the gases flowing through the tubes or see the gases flowing through the tubes as if every single fluorescent light is always out of balance and flickering. And when I say that they can see it, in unison, every person I don't even know if they know it or not, but everybody just goes and looks up. It's something they've never thought of, they never conceived, they didn't even know that was a thing. So um, it, it's really neat to see that, wow, this would be a horrible uh, pun-ish pun. Uh, anyway, uh, everybody, uh, the light bulb uh, proverbially gets switched on when they look up. Uh, I, that was unavoidable, unavoidable. Did you, do you have any, any other sensory, like smells or anything? Did you ever have issues with smells? Uh, I'm hypersensitive with my sense of smell. So that gets annoying at times. It's a big benefit at a racetrack when I can say, hey, somebody's burning brakes or check the telemetry, somebody's burning oil. Uh, so in that environment, it's an advantage, but everywhere else it's annoying. Aaron, talk I about, being touched uh yeah so um I'm, I'm not a fan of any contact that i'm not prepared up for any type of well there is a let's see ooh, a long time ago 2010 at the st louis blues game uh, i went to uh somebody gave me some really good seats about eighth row from the glass i had never been to a hockey game and in between the first and second period i went to go get something to eat and decided that, that was a bad idea because it was expensive, but the hell those nachos had my name on them. So I got the nachos and a big drink. So I'm walking back and just as I went under the, from the concourse to the stadium, they dropped the puck. So I'm walking and as I about go down the stairs, I get a tap, tap, tap on my shoulder. Okay, random taps like that, n nothing ever good comes from a random tap. Nobody goes, hey, you've won. No, it's always something really, really bad, or at least that's how I perceive it. So I get tapped and instantly I I do my two by four impersonation and I turn and the they go, uh, sir, you, you see this yellow line right here? You can't be past this yellow line right here while the puck's in play. I'm like, but I'm seated right. Sir, you can't be past this line right here, but my seat, uh, sir. Yeah. So I wander back and then um, well, a stoppage happens and it was a long time. Like there was no icing offsides for a good five minutes. So I'm trying to walk back and the same person goes, sir, I need to see your ticket. Now remember, I actually know they tapped me on the shoulder. That's what happened. They tapped me on the shoulder before I got down the stairs. So now I'm like a four by eight. I don't know, I, I can barely move. I can't flex at all. So I turn. And she goes, sir, I need to see your ticket. Well, remember, I'm holding a big drink and nachos, which I think was at least $25. So I am holding not only liquid cheese, but liquid gold. I, I, I can't let go of this, but I can't show them my ticket because it's my pocket. So I'm stuck there going, uh, uh, and for a good, I don't know, 45 seconds, I have no idea how I'm going to get this ticket out. Well, eventually somebody else that needed their ticket uh, checked just grabbed the drink from me. Now I had a hand, so I showed her the ticket. Okay, so I start progressing again. Tap, tap, tap. And all that time, they resumed play. Sir, you can't be past this. It took me till the... I, I was unable to eat till the start of the third period because that was three taps. So I guess the person scored a hat trick if we're talking hockey. But the, the, the those random, there's no way to prepare for them. There's no way to 
And then once it happens, the processing takes longer. And the fact that three happened within six or seven minutes just compounded the anxiety and the frustration and the processing thereafter to where that was $25 wasted of sodas, sodas and nachos. I was going to share a story. I don't want to get to, Susan had a question. I want to make sure we get to that. But I want a quick story about sensory issues. Um, my daughter has super sensitive smell issues as well, but some of the things that, you know, we, we bathe, we wash our hair, we use perfume, we use whatever, cologne, we use deodorant, all those smells that they sell in the stores that we think, you know, most people think smell great and we all want to smell like that. She hates all of them. And, and so for her, it, it's, a, it's a level of functionality. She goes into the classroom and she sits in there with all these kids with all these different smells and it drives her insane. And certain smells really trigger her, like cause her to salivate. So smells of like fruity flavored uh, candy or mint, minty gum, any kind of mint, she will just start salivating. And especially when she was younger, we didn't really understand why or what was causing it. It took a long time for us to realize what that was, but she would just, just it would just cause her to salivate and she would spit into her shirt and we would have a handkerchief around her neck and like we were just trying to deal with the situation without realizing what the cause was and then you know it's gotten to the point it can affect affect her test taking it can affect her concentration in class like these are huge huge triggers for some kids and understanding what those triggers are and understanding that you know, maybe you think it's fun to have gum day for everybody. Well, that might be torture for that one or two kids in the class. And maybe they should be allowed to leave the room when everybody else has gum day or something. Like just simply being aware of those issues to adapt to um, the kids who are really greatly affected by that. But Susan asked a question, Erin. She said, Erin, what would you like teachers to know about kids on the spectrum or how can teachers best help a student in our classroom? In terms of academically, uh, identifying the Kansas and trying to utilize that in as many subjects as possible. Some are going to be easy. Others might be impossible, such as one person's Kansas was the history of motorcycle helmet production. I don't know how much you can do with that. But trains, very common. Okay, where do trains go? There you have geography. What's the average speed of a train? Not, not like it's one of those story problems that a train leaves Kansas City going to minus those type of things. You can do math via trains. Um, what do trains pull? Okay, now you can do science and stuff that you can utilize the interest and springboard outward. It, it's it's it difficult to plop a kid from Kansas and put him in North Dakota. But on the trip, if you can somehow stretch the borders of Kansas as you go along, that's going to be you might get a bigger buy-in and motivation is can be extremely difficult for those on the spectrum. If we don't find relevancy or interest in something, then what's the point in doing it whatsoever? Same thing with uh, if we tried something and we failed at it. Uh, whatever happens first always has to happen. So if we failed once, that means failure is a guarantee every single time. So if you can somehow rekindle an interest by using their capital of Kansas, that supreme interest that they want to think about above all else, if you can utilize that, you may get a bigger buy-in to new activities or um, some of that they might have had trouble with before. Uh, Christine asked another question. She said, stemming is often associated with individuals with autism. Can you speak about your experience with this? Yeah, somebody actually, so, uh, it, when a, it, it's a big stress relief and I try not to do things in public because people will sometimes stop and stare when I get really excited I'll do something like this uh, but when I'm just a little bit nervous or anxious I will twirl my belt loops and I got a text message during the pre-race show on NBC on Sunday because um, the three commentators were very at the end of the pits and I'm in the flag stand a little bit in the foreground but somebody saw me and they knew it was me because they saw me twirling my belt loop. So um, that was kind of neat that I got a text and they said they saw me check my phone and uh, that, that was neat. But when when people uh, and th they knew it was me because of it, they were poking fun. It was they knew, hey, it's it's the start of a race. It's a it's a, I mean, that's a pre, it's it was the pregame. 
So of course, there's going to be a little bit of nerves. So they knew it and they knew it. that's how I calmed down. That's how I, so when people are made aware of it, there's a lot more, um, what's the word, uh, compassion on it. Uh, before I was diagnosed, you know, I was go, I could, for, when I was really nervous, you know, 1997, 98, 99, 2000, clothes are expensive, but there was no quitting me doing this. I mean, I got a new pair of pants. Those belt loops were gone in a few days because when you twirl them enough and it tears off the bottom and it's only hanging on the top, that's when the ultimate twirl in action happens. There's another great, great great time uh but now that i buy my own clothes i have to find the balance but uh, yes i mean uh as i tell officers unless it's going to hurt themselves or somebody else it's best to let it continue because it could be replaced by a more severe behavior or undesirable behavior down the road but you're taking away our coping mechanism that's what it is it is our coping mechanism it might be the filter so to speak in the life unfiltered it might be a way to put a filter in there to break those emotions that are just going so strong. Yeah, I think, thanks, Aaron. I, I, I'm that concept, Christina, what you're talking about with stimming too. I think a lot of frequently, I, I guess I don't know enough to generalize, but for many people like Aaron, what you were saying that it's often a hand motion for a lot of people. And I think with not always though, that that's with a lot of people, it can be more of a gross motor motion. So I know for my daughter, it's it's not a hand thing. It's nothing for her. It's it's running. It's literally like moving her whole body. And she's done it since she was a toddler. And she, you know, we have a kind of this really long, narrow house with this big, long hallway. And she just she just she's 17 and she still does laps up and down the hallway because and it's certain times of the day where she's just like it's her my I'm done. I'm done with homework. I'm done with school, whatever. I'm letting loose. And sometimes she'll go outside, but she's getting to the age now where she's paranoid that people will think she's weird, right? Like she doesn't just want to gallop up and down the street back and forth and back and forth because she's realized that not everybody does that, right? So she's tended to do it more now inside, but um, it's just, yeah, it's a stimulation. It's just something she needs to do to let it go. And she'll do it sometimes like in the afternoon, but then she'll, it's like guaranteed at night. And if she doesn't go to bed early and I'm already in bed, We'll hear this broom, 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 upstairs in the hallway. Like you can just hear her. She's got to get her run in before she goes to bed. It's just a necessary thing for her. I have no idea what she's going to do someday when she's living in some tiny apartment all by herself. So we'll see how she figures that out. But um, it's really important. It's an it's an important part of that, of, like you said, processing and, and um, coping, coping mechanism. Did anybody else have specific questions? I know nobody's else written anything in. If you have something you just want to ask out loud to Aaron, you're welcome to do so. I have a question. Um, Aaron, how did you kind of take it from like you know, like you said, the fingers down to the belt loop? Because I have an individual I work with kind of does a similar thing. Um, her mom calls it the zoomies, where she has to like go up and down the hall and get all that out. And she's like, she's afraid that, you know, when she goes to birthday parties and things like that, that, you know, she's going to want to do that because she gets excited, but she doesn't know how to help her kind of minimize those things or do them more in a private place. It was, I, I don't think it was a conscious progression. It just sort of, and I, I still do the finger things. If, if, I, if I get, so belt loops are anxious nerves, excited is the full that or under the ears when i'm super excited it goes from here to under the ears and um it, it's just been over time realizing I'm trying to i i don't want to say get over it but there, there comes a limit where it's like okay keep it together but if i do this in public i'm gonna have a conversation or people are gonna look they're gonna stare they might laugh and that's difficult so it, over time, it's just been a logical progression of, okay, I did this before and people laughed and then they asked me what the heck was going on. That's difficult. So I don't want to do that. But when it gets to a certain point of excitement, joy, this is going to happen regardless. So um, 
as the years went on, that level that I could sustain until I had to do it went further and further up. But it's it's still there. I just hide it better. Thank you. Anybody else have any questions they want to ask Aaron? Aaron, actually, I'd like for you to talk more about how you got into what you're doing with the racing. Because I know you mentioned yeah, so, what you're doing. Yeah, so I uh, grew up about a mile from the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. And uh, racing was one of the first things I was exposed to. So that became the capital of Kansas immediately. In 1995, I started racing go-karts because I, in my mind, was going to be the next, the greatest eight-time champion of any racing series in the world that was just going to be a given i had the skill still have the skill but it's an expensive sport but also i love the people that wave the flags it just looked it was probably a sensory thing watching the flags hearing the flags and uh, i got my first set of flags when i was about six and practicing i had i have very poor uh, coordination. I'm a walking disaster. Yet, give me a flag in my hand. If flag waving were an Olympic event, I could win the gold, silver, and bronze, the same event, the same year. Nobody else would be worthy of a medal. And that's me being humble. Uh, however, um, uh, my my uh, the person I enjoyed watching the most was the flagman of the Indy 500. And my dad was a pastor in Indianapolis. There was a member there that worked at the sanctioning body as a secretary. He asked her, hey, could you get Dwayne Sweeney's autograph? Well, she did, but Dwayne Sweeney did one better. It was his autograph on the flag, checkered flag he was going to use for the 1990 Indy 500. So I got Dwayne Sweeney's checkered. And in 95, when I started racing go-karts, the club had uh, down, our track was on Telegraph by the Merrimack River. And our club flagman was about 80 years old and going colorblind. Now, when people could get really hurt if the wrong color is being displayed, that's bad. So I volunteered to hand him the right colored flags. Well, 96 was an exceptionally hot summer, and the club sort of pushed him out. So at age 13, I became the club flagman, which now um, a series I used to flag for, eight- and nine-year-olds were like, can I flag a heat race? I said, no, you're too young. Insurance won't allow it. Well, I So I, I'm saying no to... What I did is 13 years old in charge of a racetrack. Just think about the insurance liability now. Well, in 2000, I, I, I quit racing in 03 and in 08, I picked up the world's largest go-kart race. And then 2010 got a division of USAC as their flagman. So I was flagging about 16 to 18 events a year across the country. And looking back on that, and if you go to my blog, you can see the progression in 2010 of me starting out at these new events. And then every year, things are just getting a little bit bigger, a little bit more professional, more professional. Um, every, every progression or every series I got and every event I did happened at the perfect time. Yeah, as I said, last year, I got picked up by IndyCar, which was my dream all along. Uh, so truly a dream come true. Um, last year's Indy 500 in August, being in the flag stand, I, I think I was in tears the first 60 laps. That's how, how much it meant to me. But I, I think in 2010, I would have thought, hey, I'm ready for Indy. I can do this. No, the, the uh, progression I needed, uh, I remember a blog post in 2011, the first time I worked in Phoenix. I never had Mexican food in my life. I was a stingy eater, and Jennifer, Jennifer saw more than once how many times I was a picky eater. She wouldn't recognize me now on all the stuff I'm eating around the country. But doing the job, it, there, there's more to a job than just doing the job. It's, you know, having not, if I would have got this gig 12 years ago, every meal would have been like, well, this isn't going to work for me. Okay, that. I've learned how to adjust and adapt and grow just a bit to, I don't want to say, but fit in the best I can. Uh, it's unfortunate that the unemployment rate is 80, 85% for those on the autism spectrum with Asperger's. 
I believe it's, you know, we, we I, I've had so many messages. Um, I remember my, my first year of blogging, somebody reached out from Northern Canada. She was from Iceland, had a dual doctorate in earth studies and petroleum uh, sciences. She was making near seven figures. Uh, she moved from Iceland to Canada, but the job lasted just a couple months because she could not handle the social interactions. So there was a person with unlimited potential uh, who knows what she could have created in any type of, uh, she was moving towards a green initiative, who knows what she could have discovered, but she wasn't ready for the job she got. So uh, maybe I should write a book on the need for progression and timing because that, that's a big frustrating thing for us on the spectrum is we, we want our dream right now, but we may have the talent to do just that. But I didn't realize there's so much more than just those single tasks that we have our mind on. So perhaps that's one of the problems of Kansas is that we're just looking at that one single capital, so to speak, when there is a wide state that we need to be able to navigate. So 26 years it took me to get to IndyCar and you know, working 16, 18 events uh, all over the country from 2010 to 2019 to get it. But uh, it, it shows that one hard work and dedication pays off. Uh, but sometimes waiting to get that goal is actually really good. Thanks, Aaron. Did anybody else have any questions? I think I think following okay, up with that, Aaron. Right. Go ahead, please. Oh, sorry. So I'm actually reading your book right now for a class. Ah. I have like two chapters left. Um, and so I am going to be an educator. Um, I'm in my four year degree right now. And um, just kind of your biggest tip for future educators and people I'm not going into special education but just um, ways to look for people on the spectrum within my own class uh, so uh, a big tip I would say uh, one find the motivator absolutely motivator 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 um, we can just fall into a trap of wanting to think about our one topic and that's it. Um, oh, I just had a thought. What was it? Um, single thought. Give me a second. It was going to be really good. I should have just gone to that point instead of finishing that sentence. Um, it's not like I've been up for 20 hours. Um, it was a tip, teacher. Oh, well, okay. If a student does not want to do something, um, this is probably going to be obvious, but because I said so, you will instantly get pushed back from that. But explain to it logic. Use the logical and emotional world in your advantage. Explain logically why that's going to help them, why they need to know that. And be prepared for a pushback from that. But if you can keep using logic in your favor, you are you might eventually win. Again, if you've met one person, you've met one person. And there may be some that if they're arguing that the sky is not blue, but in fact green, well, even if you've proven it, they may for a while still deny that you're correct because we just don't like being wrong. Even when we're wrong, we're right, and we will go down with the ship. Even when it's on the floor of the river, we will still stand on that boat and say it's the best boat in the world. So that's actually really good. I hope I remember that. Anyway, um, yes, uh, um, use that logic in your favor uh, the best you can. And some... Um, yeah, I think those are the, I'm going to quit while I'm ahead before I keep coming up with new metaphors and analogies that won't make as much sense as standing on the boat on the riverbed floor. So then I, I can follow up with that too, because I think as a, I'm also a teacher, right? So I have a teacher, my daughter's autistic, but um, I know for her of like, and Aaron, what you're talking about being motivated in school of like just struggling, communicating or working with the teacher, the teacher not understanding. I mean, those are really common real struggles with all teachers and it's hard to find teachers who really understand you i think and uh i know for my daughter she just 
didn't uh, prioritize school. She thought, you know, well, I don't, I don't care. Why do I have to learn any of this? Why is any of this important? You know, I just, I love my fish. I love, I mean, she's obsessed with orcas, does all her own research on the line all the time. She can tell you every orca that lives on earth and what their name is and where they live. But she, you know, when we finally started talking about, well, what's your plan? What's, what's in your future? What do you want to do? And, and knowing that that was her passion, it's like, well, if you wanted to actually go into that, this is what it would take. Like, you need a master's degree, you need a master's degree. And if you really want to, like, be out on the ocean doing research, you're probably going to need a PhD. And so she was like, you know, it was sort of this, she was maybe eighth grade. And so it was like this kind of eye-opening experience of, oh, so that means I actually have to do this stuff in school. Like, I actually have to. And, and it was like, yeah, like, if that's where you're going, then you're stuck doing all this other stuff. And you need to start, like, I know it's not always in, and she had some teachers that she really struggled with, but um, it, for her, it was just like a, okay. And she just all of a sudden like, boom, bought into it. And she just like, she works her tail off now and she's getting straight A's and she's doing really well. But it was this, it was being able to see it from her eyes, from her perspective of why do I need to do this and really explain that. And I think that's probably true for a lot of kids in general, but um, it just kind of needed to be explained to her in, in, a, in a way that made sense. So we're kind of uh, about done with our time. Does anybody else have any last minute questions for Aaron? Nope. Okay. Well, I just want to thank everybody for coming, Aaron. I have loved this so much. I mean, being able to talk face to face with you and seeing you again, it's been over 10 years since I heard you speak live. So this has been wonderful. And um, I hope everybody else enjoyed it. I hope this helped everybody answered a lot of questions, get new perspectives on, you know, what you see as a, as a person, as a human on earth, in the classroom, all those different places and, and, um, and just helping understand all the people on the spectrum, because like Aaron said, everybody is different. And whether you're on the spectrum or off the spectrum, everybody's different. So um, it's, it's, it's just accepting all of that about one another. So thanks again, Aaron, so much. And I put everybody, if you want to look at the chat, I did put a link to Aaron's uh, book, the page for his book findingkansas.com. If you want to look that up, his book is really great. Um, it's a great tool to use as well to help others understand. So um, thank you very much. Hope everybody has a good night. <laughs>